So there was a time when the premiums went about 30% on silver. And, you know, I don't know if this will happen or not. And I am biased and pretty optimistic on the future of the metals markets, the precious metals markets. But there could be, not would be, but could be a situation where we see something like that again. And it could even go further. So there's a lot to consider what could happen with silver because it was perceived as money and it, it adhered to the natural ratio because that's all it was. So its use was money and gold's use was money and that's all they were used for. They, they adhered to the natural ratio, 12 to one. If you got into silver below 20, if this market does half as well as I think it's going to, you're gonna look like a genius in three or four years. Thanks for watching this RTD interview. Don't forget to pick up your RTD Scary George Round, only available at stbullion.com. Now enjoy this interview. Welcome back to Rethinking a Dollar. Today I'm excited to have returning guest, Mr. David Morgan, also known as the Silver Guru of the Morgan Report. Today Dave joins us to share his thoughts on a variety of subject matter. So Dave, welcome back. Hi, thanks for having me back. It's great to be with you. Well, Dave, I appreciate you taking time for us. As always, there's a lot of things happening in the silver market, you know, the financial markets, the debt market, you name it. Curious to find out what's on your mind, but more important, before we dive in any further, curious to find out, you know, at this current point in time, you know, what concerns David the most? Well, Mike, I'm really not sure how to answer that. I mean, anyone that's listened to me from, you know, 1999 onward knows I've been concerned about the fact that all fiat currencies eventually fail and that this is a global problem and all that. And I don't think I need to really repeat it, but certainly I'm concerned about that. I think that right now what we're seeing is a move into the safe haven of gold primarily. And it's not the trade war. Does that have something to do with it? Yes, it may. But primarily it's that uh, more people, uh, especially on the, on the uh, institutional side, believe it or not, are saying, you know what, this is not going well. What isn't going well? The economic contraction of the global economy, that's what's not going well. China's in big trouble. They caught uh, the United States Keynesian disease years ago, overbuilt, used a lot of misallocation of capital, built stuff, these ghost cities and a lot of things. And I'm not trying to pick on China because we've done it, basically everybody's done it. So we have this fiat system that concerns me. I think I probably said enough, but well, let me just make one more point that I'm trying to make. The markets have recognized that fact at some level and the institutions are moving into gold. All right, so we see the fact that, you know, along with the currencies, the representations of those currencies happens to be the bond market. And so the negative yielding debt continues to increase. And so in your opinion, how much longer can that uh, debt uh, basically turn into more junk status than anything else before something has to give in, in the financial markets, which will unfortunately reflect in more of the you know, metals prices. Well, Mike, I've gotten a little better over the years because I've been picked on so much. I shouldn't say picked on. I sound like a, a victim mentality and I'm far from that. But, you know, I make calls by the best of my ability and, you know, with the manipulated market, which might be an excuse, it's a little tough. So I've gotten pretty good about not giving it time on anything, but I'm going to answer your question. So I was in London. I have an affiliate program in London that uh, basically does options trading on the SLV and the GLD. And I'm all in favor of it if and only if you've established a physical position first. But that's, you know, beside the point. The point is this. When I was in London, I interviewed with the gentleman that produced the Four Horsemen film that I was uh, – honored to be in along with several other well-known thinkers. Mm -hmm. And he asked me that same question. And that was a year ago. And I still believe this is the correct answer. I could be proven wrong, but I don't think we have five years. And that was a year ago. So I think four years. Now, does that mean everything burns to the ground? Does that mean shipping stops? Does that mean no communications? Does that mean the grid's down? No, it means none of those things. What it means is that we have enough trouble, as you stated, Mike, in a bond market where there's some serious misallocations that are corrected where it could be in the u.s debt markets where it should you know be corrected at some point in time so that's a pretty bold call to say we've got like basically four more years before something's got to give but i truly believe that we push this thing so far for so long and lie to ourselves for so many times on so many things that sooner or later is the old expression the truth will out 
the truth comes out. You can't live the lie of printing wealth. It doesn't work. So that's what I think. I think we've got about four years. Four years. Now, in, along with those four years, uh, I'm curious to find out your thoughts and opinions on the, the back and forth or the, the one direction that our current president has towards uh, his, it looks like, dislike towards the Federal Reserve policy and the, and the fact that he mentions that we're behind while everyone else drops. And so uh, in that four years, we, we got a presidential election coming up within that same time frame. So we'll either have the same president or someone new. Now, w- will that matter at all? Or it's inevitable that if this thing has to come to an end or adjustment or reboot or whatever, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'll give you two thoughts. One, I was asked basically the question about, you know, Trump well before the election. I was in Canada doing uh, an interview and this woman asked, you know, what do you think about Trump or if he is elected, what would that mean? And the answer at that time was it really doesn't matter if Trump's elected or not because it's basically putting someone on the Titanic with Trump in office. You'll probably see more employment. You'll probably see a livelier tune played by the band. You might get more luxury chairs. And I think you'll get a feel-good atmosphere, but the ship's going down. Now, having said that, I want to add on to that. I don't know really what Trump thinks about the Fed, but it's very interesting. And I've talked to, and I hope you don't mind me talking about other websites, but uh, I've interviewed with Dave of X22 a few times, and and I had him on my podcast. I'm pretty picky, uh, regardless. And, you know, with Andrew Jackson on the wall in the Oval Office and the way he bashes the Fed over and over again, Dave is of the belief, and I'm open-minded enough to think that there could be, I'm not saying would be, but could possibly be a situation where we get rid of the illegal Fed. I mean, the Fed was done basically at Christmas time in 1912 and signed into law in 1913, and it's unconstitutional. So if we let these European bankers run the United States monetary system, which they have for over 100 years, and let's just hypothetically say that Trump's got enough protection to take the bankers on like Andrew Jackson and not uh, end up with uh, a lot of uh, soil above him, it's possible. And so am I saying that's going to happen? No. But is it possible? Yes. So the long-winded answer is, look, If someone came in and reestablished where the treasury was responsible for creating the credit in the country, especially without interest, and we paid our own way internally where the United States was uh, sovereign with its debt and it wasn't controlled by basically Europeans that run the Fed. I know the member banks are in the commercial banks part of the Fed and they've kind of watered it down. But the truth of the matter is it started uh, primarily without many Americans even on the, on the Fed or in the Fed that own the, the private shares of it. But anyway, back on point. You came in, got the Treasury involved, got rid of the Fed, and started manufacturing the United States note like John F. Kennedy did before he was assassinated, we could see a big change. Now, you know, Mr. David Morgan, what are you really saying? The saying is, look, it could happen. Is it going to happen? I don't know. Would it be beneficial? Yes. Would it be painful? Absolutely. And of course, the last thing the bankers hardly ever do is lose, but it is, I don't know, a remote possibility. So long answer. So the early answer was, you know, doesn't matter who's in the tight, the ships, the Titanic is going down. But if that captain grabs a hold of it and they repair that boat and they take over who's controlling it, it could make a difference. Yeah, I do agree. It could make a difference. And that particular viewpoint is very optimistic. And so I appreciate that. And so my only question would then be, that's just one ship. And so that's the Titanic. It so happens to be the reserve currency Titanic. But yet, you know, when, when you hear about the China, I heard just recently the cryptocurrency is being rolled out. They got five corporations that's looking to be issued that particular currency first. So we can make those plans here. But what about our partners and allies and enemies and all the things that the other nations? Because according to history, when the empires end, it usually doesn't end pretty. And then what comes next usually, you know, disrupts everything before. So, you know, what about the, the, the opposite of, of that equation as well? Yeah. Now, I, Mike, I like your thinking. I like your title, Rethinking the Dollar. Yeah, I mean, look, it's pretty obvious what they, the powers that be, the elite, the, the top-tier banking system people, 
they want to cast this aside and everything's traced, tracked and taxed. And that means crypto fits perfectly with that because everything goes on the ledger and it can be recalled for forever, basically. So certainly I think there's a push that way, especially for centralization where central control, because a lot of the Bitcoin slash alternative cryptocurrency people say it's anonymous and you know, and some of them are, I know that. But uh, look, the <clears throat> again, I repeat, the bankers seldom lose. So that's, an excellent point. That's the direction we're definitely heading. My little uh, detour, you might say, on you know the treasury taking over the printing of the money rather than a private corporation is maybe more wishful thinking than reality. So I would say, Mike, what I really think as far as where are we going, we're probably going down that path where either they let it contr they control the collapse and maintain their ability to uh you know maintain their ability to control the currency it just takes a different form where it's some type of cryptocurrency or you know in the very unlikely scenario where the you know, whole thing breaks apart and we start seeing everything come closer to home which would mean nation states with their true independent national currency with no premier reserve currency but as Jim Richards has said, and I think Jim's one of the better thinkers out there, and I say that often, uh, I don't know him real well, but we've crossed paths and talked a, a few times briefly. But, you know, they will push for the SDR probably. And of course, what's the SDR? Well, it's a basket of currencies is what it is. And it's just got a fancy title on it. So, Mike, I really don't know. I mean, you know my th feelings. I'm not exactly a libertarian, but I'm for, you know, freedom. I'm for people being able to determine their own destiny. I hate the uh, invasion of privacy. I got nothing to hide, really, at my age and stuff. Yeah, I've got the past that I've done stuff I'm ashamed of, but who doesn't? Yeah. The point I'm making is just to be able to be left alone. And, you know, just the thought of going, I'm sorry I'm not aggressing, <laughs> just the thought of going grocery shopping and they're filming everything that you do, whatever you get apple you pick up. And I mean, it's just ridiculous, but that's what we've become. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's sad because it, it looks like uh, what's happening out in Hong Kong is an indication of what people, they don't, they no longer want to be monitored, tracked, surveilled, and all that stuff like that. Because I'm assuming, you know, you've seen pictures of people covering their eyes up and, the facial, they cut down facial recognition cameras. And I just saw recently about the, the possible declar declaration of uh, martial law over there. Now, it, so any moment now, there could be some type of an event that could literally bring everything to a halt or freeze or collapse or correction. Now, I want to get into metals. And so just recently, last couple of weeks, especially in the mainstream news, metals have been getting more attention now. And around us, every other country has already had all time highs, but yet we haven't experienced it just, just yet here. Now, what's the trigger outside the country, and then will those same events cause a, a major spike here in this country? On the metals? Yes. Yeah, boy, that's a tough question. I really don't know. You know what? You ask me to, you know, look in the future and say this event will will move it. But I can tell you that uh, there's a couple scenarios, and I'll speak in a general way. One is, as you've already mentioned several times, and you're spot on. That's the depth. I mean, somebody in China says, you know what? I hate this trade war. We'll show Trump who's boss. We've got, you know, this X amount of treasury. We're going to dump them all in the market right now at the market, which means the clearing, even with the algorithms, the clearing will just go down, 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 because the market order will go and take every market order that's out there. And of course, the algorithm will see the thing falling and away we go. So that's a scenario. The other one would be the opposite of it, or maybe both at the same time where China says, uh, you know, we've got all this paper gold right now. We want it turned into physical, ship it, ship it yesterday. We want it, you know, ASAP. And or add on to their position that's rather substantial already. So it could be, and it could be a number of other things. But those would be the two most likely to me. Some disruption in the physical gold market that's recognized on a nation state or a very large basis and or a, a, a debt market mini crisis that unravels and actually builds momentum like a snowball going downhill. I mean, if the Chinese started off in the bond market and the, taking the treasury market down, yields would automatically start to spike up. And you would see probably some, uh, you know, some followers. In other words, 
you know, someone else with a, a substantial amount of U.S. debt would see what's going on in the market. They'd get a, you know, flash on their computer screen and say, oh, my goodness, I don't know what China's doing, but they know something I don't. But I know I got to sell. And that kind of thing feeds on itself. So those are two. I think those are, you know, worthwhile answers to, to at least think about. <clears throat> now, in regards to silver, let's get to silver, to sil yeah. silver guru. Uh, Recent activity, last couple of days, you know, not a little less than a dollar, but yet it's significant enough to get a lot of people's attention. Sure. What are some things that, you know, has possibly triggered that or what, what have you heard about, you know, from the silver market or, or what was the reason for all that? Shine some light on for us. Yeah, great. I wish I had absolute solid answers for you, Mike. I don't. I just did an update for my subscribers, my, you know, paid people last night. And I was surprised when it full up the street. First of all, let me just preface with this. The last time gold was in this this range, silver was at like twenty five bucks, and we're sitting here at eighteen. So, you know, silver certainly lagging. It's gone from a gold silver ratio of ninety five to about eighty five, which shows you silver is outperforming gold right now, uh, somewhat. But you know, an eighty five ratio is still way too high in my view. So, when I did this update for the Morgan Report members. I was a little surprised to see that we actually have cleared almost all of the congestion from 2017 onward. So almost from, excuse me, October, November, 2017 onward. Uh, back in July of 2016, we were at $21 silver. So, when you break through that much resistance, about you know, almost a year's worth in one fell swoop, that's pretty impressive. However, I also know how these algos run and how these bullion bankers are. So I've said this and I'll repeat, and I hope I'm wrong. Normally when you br break through that much resistance, it gets pushed back down and into that resistance level. If the market's strong, it pops up through it again. And then it gets pushed down again, it pops up through it again, and it's on its way, or usually it's the fourth time. So I actually expect to see silver push back down into that traded range for one, two, or three more times. Once, but the volume that we went through it on was significantly, noticeably higher, not like, oh my goodness, it's such a big amount of volume, there's nothing that's gonna stop it. No, not that kind of volume, but a very decent volume. So I really, want to see silver get down the 81 gold silver ratio sorry if i'm folks i'm looking over to the other screen to look at my charts while i'm talking no so problem. i really want to see um you know the 80 to 1 ratio and once i get to the 71 ratio which is still too high but you know from 95 to 1 to 70 to 1 is quite a move in silver's favor relative to how poor it performed relative to gold over the last several months or higher. Is it going to happen this year? If you would ask me that a month ago, I probably said, I'm not so sure right now. I'm not positive. Another prediction, folks, I could be wrong. So I hate doing the time thing. And uh, I haven't seen the market trade like this in a long time. So it's 20 possible. Yeah, it's possible. It's going to happen. I don't know. There isn't a lot of resistance up to 2021 once you break through the level we just broke through, which is good. You know, there's the overhead resistance doesn't really start until you're at, you know, yeah, 1950 or something like that. So. Yeah, I think that, you know, just my opinion is that with all the turmoil and chaos around us and all time highs that's being set in other currencies, it's going to be very hard to keep it well below 20 in this in the Federal Reserve currency itself. So I think just from outside pressures, eventually something's going to give. And when it snaps and, you know, you know, a hell will break loose and it's going to, you know, go back to where it should go. But my question for you, you mentioned that, you know, seeing some good volume. So what, where's who's 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 acquiring these metals? Who's acquiring? Yeah, it's the institutions. It's unbelievable. I mean, as I said earlier in the, our discussion here, most of the money is coming in into the ETFs and into the, the big money. The retail market is actually pretty poor right now, meaning the spreads between the bid and ask on, you know, silver eagles or silver rounds or silver bars or and gold as well is pretty minimal. The spreads are tight and that tight because there's a lot of product out there in the retail side that um, 
isn't moving. The reason it isn't moving is some people are selling their gold, you know, finally made it back in the 1500. I bought it six years ago at this price. They tell their wife, hey, Martha, you know, <laughs> we didn't lose any money on gold. You know, I bought it at 15 and we got 1525 for it or whatever. So there is some of that going on. And so it's interesting, but that's where it's coming from. It's a lot of paper trading and a lot of ETF movement. And all that, I'll take the market at wherever it comes. I mean, the gold coins, gold bar, 400 ounce gold bar, whatever it is, never stops and asks the question, why did you buy me? Hmm. You know, it does. It's, you know, it, it's bought because, and there's a myriad of reasons. But as I said, if I'm going to put my neck out, it's because of the financial systems breaking down and these people that are at the, the point of the spear know it, and they're moving into gold because they know what happens. Yeah. Now you referenced, you know, just the, the, the premium, premium above spot price. Now, you know, right now it's, it's, it's relatively small, but when stuff breaks and stuff really hits the fan, you know, I, I haven't really been in the metals that long. I'm late to the party as far as being awakened to the reality of our monetary system. So I, I never witnessed, you know, extremely high uh, premiums. And so when things break, what, what are some possible premiums that we could see on the retail side when people actually yeah. decide to rush? Yeah. Well, great question. And, uh, Thanks for your honesty. I think you really do a great interview. And again, you you do rethink. You do think. And I love people with intellect. So anyway, back on the point. Yeah, in the 2008 financial crisis, everyone thought, you know, whatever they thought. The reality is that silver was at around the $9 level on the paper markets, the futures exchanges, but it was like 30% higher in the retail side. No one... Andy Sheckman called me up and asked if I could help him. And I said, help you what? He says, find some silver. And I said, I maybe can. And there was an industrial producer that was doing industrial silver, which is wire and mesh and pellets and uh, all the stuff that's used for the industrial side of silver. So I actually um, got them to consider making 100 ounce bars, which they'd never done. They'd never done any retail product. Of course, the retail side marks up higher than what the commercial, you know, stuff does. So they started making 100 ounce bars. So Andy was able to source metal when hardly anyone else could. So there was a time when the premiums went about 30% on silver. And, you know, I don't know if this will happen or not. And I am biased and pretty optimistic on the future of the metals markets, the precious metals markets, but there could be, not would be, but could be a situation where we see something like that again, and it could even go further, where it's either, as Greg Hunter says, I'll give Greg credit, because he's the one who started it, you either have it or you don't. I mean, when things, if, if it gets to the point where the psychology changes, where people view silver for its most biggest and important use, which is money, not you know a product in your cell phone, and there's a rush into it. You know, I want to digress a little bit further. I just did uh, an update lecture interview, and I explained that 0.02% of the world's wealth is, is represented by silver. And people gain, didn't understand what I was saying, so try to make it clear here. If you take 0 0.02 and you multiply it by 50, that equals one. So that's how you get 1%. Now, right now, about... 1% of the world's wealth is in gold right now, but only 0 0.02. So my point is, you know, 50 times 0 0.02 equals one. That's a fact. Don't argue about that or show your ignorance. Now, the, I think with a, so some people didn't even get that part of it. The other part of it is I'm not saying that you could buy 50 times the amount of silver that's already owned at that price. Are you kidding me? What I'm suggesting is if you ever got on par with the amount of people that own silver, for the same reason they own gold, because it's a safe haven money asset, that it would be a substantial increase in price because if there was a demand of 50 times what it is now, and it equaled gold being 1% of the world's wealth represented in silver equal to the 1% in gold right now. Can you imagine what the price would be? So all I'm suggesting is that silver has a multitude of uses, but it's higher and best use is money. And the reason we know that for a fact is when gold and silver were money and nothing but in the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, 4,000 years, they traded at the natural, natural ratio, which is 12 to 1, 16 to 1. Everyone that says that's wrong. There's a 16 to 1 mine that had ratio close to that. But 
The natural ratio is 12 to 1 or less. And the reason it's only about 9 to 1 now is most silver is deposited near the Earth's surface. It's so like the oil market. All the easy to get to silver has been taken, uh, just like in the oil situation. So there's a lot to consider what could happen with silver because it was perceived as money and it, it adhered to the natural ratio because that's all it was. So its use was money and gold use was money and that's all they were used for. They, they adhered to the natural ratio, 12 to 1. When silver got adjusted, then uh, Sir Isaac Newton, Newton pegged it about 15 and a half to 1, I believe. So that's where 16 to 1 comes from. That's an established ratio, not an in the earth ratio. So there's a lot of people in the silver world that get that wrong. That kind of bugs me because it shows me how much they've studied the silver market. But then again, it's sort of my passion, as we all know. Yeah. So I think I answered your question. But honestly, this if you got into silver below 20, if this market does half as well as I think it's going to, you're going to look like a genius in three or four years. Yeah. Well, David Morgan, as always, it was great to speak with you to get your insights on what's going on, what silver is happening in the silver world. So I appreciate you joining us on here. Any last thoughts you want to leave us with as well? I'll put all the information. People know where to find you at, but I'll put it down below just because. Any last thoughts you want to leave us with? Yeah, I think I do. Uh, you know, I, this, I think the best thing to do if you want you know, everything for free, which a lot of people do, and that's fine. I get it. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, most of that stuff comes, my staff, two of my staff have access to my Twitter account. But they sell the post. Almost everything on there is for me. And the reason I post on there, yeah, I do a little advertising. I mean, I've got to make a living. But a lot of it has to do with the economic stories that are so important for everybody to know. And I put those up on there. So you don't have to read everything I write or anything like that. You know, just check it once in a while. And, you know, oh, my goodness. And the YouTube channel as well. Uh, once in a while, there was a great repost that I did with uh, Carl Bass interviewing, uh, <clears throat> doing an interview, and it was just really pertinent to, with Steve Bannon on the China situation. And he dug deep, and it was very enlightening. And I think anyone that really wants to know what's really going on with China and what this trade war thing is really all about. You know, you don't have to be on my channel, but just find an interview with Carl Bass and he will get, become much more enlightened about what's really happening. So remember, fiat fails, but that doesn't mean everything draws to, <laughs> drops to zero or stops moving, but it will be a challenge. And I'm up for it. You're up for it. So we can keep smiling. Mike, thanks for having me on here.